it's our, the start of our final day. We're very lucky to have Hitoshi Muriyama from Berkeley, um, and he's going to talk about the, a TV frontier in particle astrophysics. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I need to start my talk with a big apology. So this title is not what I chose. The organizers kept asking me what the title of my talk would be. I never responded. So they put something up. And in fact, if I had told them what I'm going to talk about, maybe I was not allowed to this conference because my talk has very little to do with TEV, but mostly with sub-GEV. So uh, that's a big apology. And of course, what I'm going to talk about is dark matter, and we have evidence on, on all scales, as everybody here knows, from galactic scale, galaxy cluster scale, and cosmology scale, cosmological scales. So we believe dark matter exists. And uh, we have been sort of fixated on this idea of WIMPs at the TV energy scale because what people call the WIMP miracle. So by looking at this uh, two to two annihilation process from two dark matter particles into the standard model, and if you go through uh, some simple estimate, again, here everybody knows that uh, the typical mass of dark matter you would prefer is something like 300 GeV1 TV mass scale. And, and, and so that's what we call miracle, namely that weak-ish coupling just like about the size of the, the <coughs> weak interaction in the standard model, and weak ish mass scale on a few hundred GeV to TeV uh, ends up giving you the correct abundance. So that's sort of miracle squared. And that's why we've been talking about this TeV energy scale a lot in this context. And, and you know, this idea was already sort of the main idea when I got into the field, and, and that was probably based on a sociology like this one. So the particle physicists back in the 80s, I think, they used to think, that we need to solve big problems about the standard model from particle physics point of view. And, and the big problems may be hierarchy problems, strong CB problem, and so on, which we don't have answer to within the standard model itself. That's why we have to extend the theory. And it is great if those solutions also give dark matter candidate as an option. It would be kind of nice. That's the way we used to think. <clears throat> and that's why we always talked about these big ideas like supersymmetry, exit dimensions, and so on. And, and so uh, that this is the way people used to think, and that's the, the way I, I learned about dark matter from particle physics point of view when I was gotten in grad school. And that was probably because the dark matter problem was not so well established back in the 80s, and the, uh, the people always wanted to solve particle physics problem first, and dark matter was in some sense an option. And, and using this paradigm of WIMPs, of course, people have been looking for the signal all over the place from colliders, underground, uh, indirect detection in cosmic rays, and so on. But as we all know, there's no clear signal yet. And LHC hasn't seen any uh, signs of new physics. That explains the hierarchy problem either. So uh, I, I've been going through sort of re rethinking these days, and many people in the audience are doing the same thing, I believe. So uh, no, dark matter definitely exists. And maybe the hierarchy problem is rather optional. Uh, so maybe we should turn these things around. And uh, if you think this way, uh, we want to explain dark matter on its own, not necessarily tacking on, on some of the, the solutions to big problems in particle physics. It, it's definitely a problem we have to solve. So uh, maybe we should think about dark matter by itself. And uh, 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 <clears throat> so we can decouple these two issues. And, and in some sense, we may not really need these big ideas like supersymmetry. So I started feeling like, let's say the dark matter is a fly on the wall, and, and you bring in big tools like supersymmetry, so basically bring in a cannon to try to uh, kill a fly on the wall. So that's the way I started to feel. Of course, dark matter is a little bit more than a fly on the wall, I think, but anyway. So uh, we may not need to really think about these huge ideas of extending space-time and so on necessarily if the dark matter is the sort of problem we would like to solve by itself. So maybe we can use much more simple idea, maybe older ideas in quantum field theory to attack these issues. So that's the way I started to think about this thing uh, in the last several, uh, several years. And of course, <coughs> we don't really know anything about dark matter. So if you actually uh, try to constrain the mass of dark matter, so this heavy bit is constrained by microlensing and so on. Here, the dark matter wouldn't fit inside the galactic scale. And here, we don't really have any good ideas, so let's exclude that. And, and if you further uh, expand this region, then here are the, some of the, the, the ideas I myself played with in, in the past. So we have you know, literally no idea what the mass of the mass of dark matter is. And, and in particular, I'd like to actually talk about this idea called strongly interacting massive particle in this mass range. That's why it's a sub-GEV. 
So as I was thinking through these things, one day I listened to a beautiful talk by Yonet Hochberg. Uh, she was a postdoc in Berkeley, and, and that's when I first heard of this idea of strongly interacting massive particles. So uh, instead of the WIMP miracle, we'll be talking about SIMP miracle. And the idea is that instead of this two to two annihilation process, we rely, rely on this three to two annihilation process to reduce the abundance of dark matter down to the level you actually need uh, for the purpose of the, uh, getting the correct cosmological abundance. And if you go through a simple estimate, you actually do find that the kind of mass scale you need for this purpose is sub GeV, like 300 MeV. And so this is actually the, uh, the, the energy scale of the strong interaction we know. And also for the purpose of making this three to two process effective, you also need a strong interaction where sort of typical coupling may be order four pi. So this is also a miracle. You have strong-ish mass scale and you have strong-ish coupling, just in the same way that in a wing case, you have the weak-ish coupling and weak-ish mass scale. And that's what the, these people have already worked out. <clears throat> And uh, this is just a way of uh, doing a simple estimate. So this is the standard case of two to two annihilation. And you change this to three to two. And, and the, the typical estimate you go through is very similar to what you do in a two to two, two, two case. And that's how you end up with the 300 GeV kind of mass scale. But when I joined this uh, the, uh, discussion, uh, the day actually didn't have a concrete theory that would realize these uh, strong three to two interaction process and that leads to the correct abundance of the, the, the strong interacting massive particle dark matter. So that's when it joined and then quickly realized is that all you have to do is to copy strong interaction, just a QCD. The only thing you have to do is to make the mass of the quarks in QCD degenerate. Let's say you have, let's say, three quarks, up, down, and strange, make them all degenerate. Then you have the bound state pions or kaons, and they're also degenerate. But because these pions and kaons carry the, the quantum number of the flavor in this uh, uh, the, uh, dark QCD, they actually end up being stable. And we know exactly what to do to analyze this question because the theory of pions is described by the famous Kyle Lagrangian. The only thing you need to know is the, how the symmetry breaks from, let's say, uh, SU4 to SO4 in this case. And then you have this coset space, and then you know what the Lagrangian is. But for most cases of the combination of the gauge group and, and the number of flavors, you also find this additional term called vesumino witten term. And if you actually look at this, it's precisely one, two, three, four, five point interaction among pions. So that can lead to this three to two annihilation process. And then, and then the rest is to just go through it quantitatively to make sure that you get everything uh, uh, correct at the end of the day. So that's the idea. And the simplest theory you can actually write is really, really simple. So uh, the, this is the simplest theory you can write. Just take SU2 gauge theory. And in the SU2 gauge theory, you have uh, quarks in, in the, uh, the uh, a smallest representation, doublets. So I introduce four doublets. Then among these four doublets, I can rotate them by SU4 symmetry. But this flavor symmetry is broken by, this, uh, by quark binding and condensate, just like in the QCD we know, uh, down to SO5. So that gives you uh, coset space SO6 or SO5. So you actually get five pions in this theory. And if you write out this Vesumino term, it really is just given by this term of the fine point interaction and, and it's, it's manifestly invariant under the symmetry. So all these indices are contracted. So this is SO5 invariant and space-time indices are also by a contractible leverage with symbol. So that's the interaction. And, and, and then you can just go through the mass quantitatively. And this is the simplest theory, but it's actually very general. So the gauge group can any of these, SUN, SBN, SON, and as long as the number of flavors is not basically the smallest possible, so uh, NF greater than or equal to three for SUN theory, so UDS, and for the SP case, you need to have two flavors or more. SON gauge theory, you need three flavors or more. Then actually Witten told us uh, this topological condition when this term actually arises, namely that the coset space has non-trivial this uh, 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 pi five, the fifth homotopy group, and then you're guaranteed to have this Vesumino term. So the, this is actually a very general theory. So it's just sort of just a copy of QCD and that just, just does the job without doing anything uh, really on top of it. And uh, we also re later realized that here we are talking about pions as the bound states that lead to strong interaction. 
but also it could be a non abelian vector bosons. So we recently actually worked that out with these additional people, even though I'm not going to actually talk much about it today. So, uh, so it's actually a very general idea, it turns out. So then the theory is basically just a copy of QCD, and you add the mass terms to quarks, and, and just keep them degenerate. And then uh, theory confines, so you turn into this chiral Lagrangian description together with this Vesumino term. And then you expand this chiral field into the power series in these pion fields. So you have the kinetic term, mass term, four-point interaction, both with, without, and with derivatives. And then you have this five-point interaction and higher orders and so on. So that's the, <clears throat> that's the starting point of all calculations you can do. Now, now that we actually have a concrete theory to do with, instead of just the idea of the SIMPs, but now we have a concrete theory, you can work out not just abundance, but other characteristics, like the self-interaction among these SIMP dark matter particles. And it's actually interesting that if you try to get the correct abundance, you have to be on these solid lines. So here we're talking about the SUN uh, gauge theories with different number of flavors. And uh, you always end up for the mass of the dark matter particle to be somewhere between 100 MeV and 1 GeV, so sub-GeV dark matter. So a central value is something like 300 MeV. So it's really the same energy scale as our strong interaction, but it's a dark a strong interaction here. But for the, for the mass range where you do get the correct abundance, you, if you also work out this, um, uh, the, 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 the self-interaction uh, among dark matter particles, then you find that uh, the, the cross-section, uh, given in the unit of centimeter square of a gram, is about one. And the reason we chose this unit is, as you'll see uh, in, in a few minutes, this is the interesting number because that actually ends up uh, 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 changing the, the mass profile of dark matter particles in the galaxies. And uh, so that's simply because these, these particles are bound states. They have finite size. And because the mass scale of this interaction is really the same as the ordinary strong interaction, so confinement scale is something of the order of 10 to minus 12 centimeter. And so the, the, the geometric size of these bound states is about 10 to minus 24 centimeters squared. That's about one barn. And, and that actually ends up giving you this, uh, the cross-section over mass to be about a square centimeter per gram. So without tuning anything, we actually get this uh, very interesting value for the self-interaction among these uh, uh, dark matter particles. And this situation is not special for uh, these, ga these uh, gauge groups, but also uh, uh, SU gauge groups and SO gauge groups. So more or less, the situation is, is the same. Well, no matter which gauge group you pick, uh, 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 how many flavors you got. So this is what I meant. So uh, there has been this long-standing issues that if you look at the mass profile in dwarf galaxies, uh, the mass profile doesn't seem to be uh, consistent with this uh, famous NFW profile, which has the sort of uh, the cuspy behavior towards the center, but rather uh, like a core, namely that sort of flattens out uh, towards the center. And of course, it's controversial whether this is really an issue with the dark matter property, or maybe uh, some dynamics or baryons can flatten the profile out. So this has been certainly a controversial subject. But the point here is that, that these issues, uh, uh, the, the size of the cross-section I mentioned earlier, about one square centimeter per gram, is just the right number uh, to affect the, uh, the mass profile or density profile of dark matter in dwarf galaxies. And, and I think two years ago, there has been also this analysis of the merging galaxies. The four galaxies are actually uh, at the, at the, at, at, um, just about to merge. And when they did also the weak lensing study, uh, are you uh, looking at the system, so the background galaxies are distorted. So here are the contours uh, that shows the, the mass density of the dark matter uh, in these systems. And what's going on is that the luminous matter here and the dark matter are slightly offset. And, and one possible explanation for this is to assume that dark matter does have a self-interaction, so that basically gives the pressure uh, of the dark matter gas so that the dark matter can be pushed back uh, relative to the luminous matter that is actually moving forward uh, to merge with the other galaxies. And again, in this system, the kind of cross-section that might explain this behavior uh, is about the same, about one square centimeter per gram. So this, indeed is an interesting number, and, and this theory automatically gives you that kind of uh, size of the self-interaction. Now, one issue we have to think about 
is that if dark matter sector has the three to two annihilation process and is totally decoupled from the standard model, it actually doesn't work. It needs to have some level of interaction with the standard model, which is actually a good thing because that in principle can give us some interesting experimental signature. And the reason why totally decoupled sector would not work is something what was pointed out by a Lawrence Hoeing company a long time ago. And uh, uh, so uh, if the dark matter uh, annihilates within uh, among themselves and don't go to the standard model, then as the number density decreases, the entropy in that sector is now shared among smaller number of particles, and therefore it starts to heat up relative to the standard model. So this wouldn't lead to cold dark matter. It becomes very hot. So uh, that has been uh, pointed out a long time ago, and, and so in our case, of course, we have to make sure that it's not just this the three to two annihilation among these dark pions themselves, but that some level of communication to the standard model. So uh, we are not interested in dark matter particles annihilating into the standard model, but we are rather interested in, in the dark matter particle interacting with the standard model particle so that they can remain uh, with the same temperature. So as the dark matter annihilates among themselves, the, the, the entropy uh, 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 is, is now shared by fewer number of the dark matter particles, but that entropy can then be transferred to the standard model particles so that they can maintain the same temperature. So you need some level of communication between them. And the simpler thing we tried is to basically uh, use the dark photon. So we know in the standard model side, the QCD uh, has particles with electrical charges, so they do couple to photon. So in the same way, this dark QCD can also couple to its own photon, or we call dark photon. And dark photon and our photon could have this, uh, 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 can have this kinetic mixing between them. And this is an arbitrary parameter, which can be rather small. Uh, it's typically uh, induced by the loop uh, uh, diagram. So this can be order 10 to minus three or so typically. And, and so this kind of uh, 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 interaction can maintain the standard model and this sector in equilibrium. And, they, and, and also, of course, this is not the only possibility. For example, uh, together with Caitlin Schutz and Robert McGehee, I think Caitlin is an audience here. Uh, uh, there she is, great, great. So we're also looking at the other uh, possibility of uh, using Axion to connect these two sectors. But let me focus on this uh, vector uh, uh, boson for now. And it's very simple to come up with a theory that, that actually does it. So you just need to assign these uh, simple electrical charges to the quarks in that sector, and the bound states end up having these doubly charged state and three neutral states in the simplest case I, I mentioned earlier. And uh, the, even though, so the, their masses may be slightly split because of this uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, electrical, uh, electromagnetic interaction, they are again coming from loops, so uh, they are perfectly uh, degenerate enough for the co annihilation process of 3D2 annihilation. And, and they're also stable because these particles are the, the particles charged under this uh, a new uh, dark photon, and they are lightest charged particles, so they can't decay. And three neutral ones are also uh, uh, stable because they have this uh, uh, triplet uh, flavor quantum number, again, the lighter state with this non-trivial flavor uh, qu uh, quantum number, so they are also absolutely stable. So uh, this is the simple way of assigning these uh, uh, charges. Then you can look again quantitatively on the, the constraints. So this is the mass of the dark photon. And certainly, we don't want these dark pions to annihilate into this dark photon, which can then decay into E plus E minus, for example. So we want to be actually above this line. So the, the, uh, this dark photon has to be heavier than, let's say, uh, uh, a few hundred MeV. And this epsilon is the size of the kinetic mixing. So when this kinetic mixing is large, then we might have already produced this dark photon at the collider experiment. So you exclude this large coupling up there. And the strongest limit is coming from Babar. That's an E plus E minus experiment, a slack that has been finished. Uh, but again, you get the sort of typically 10 to the minus three for the kinetic mixing as the constraint. But you still see this wide parameter space. Uh, this is in, 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 in white. And uh, if you go below this line, this kinetic mixing becomes too small to maintain the equilibrium between the standard model and, and the SIMPs. So that's why we need to be sort of in this triangle region but it's still uh, completely viable. And one uh, thing we did recently is to look at this uh, uh, actually exciting prospect of uh, trying to look for these particles uh, better at an E plus E minus machine. 
And the reason why E plus D minus machine is very good for this purpose is because of simple kinematics. So if you have E plus E minus annihilating into a photon, that's the usual photon you can see, and another one, a photon now mixed into the dark photon, and, and let's say that decays into this dark sector, then here you don't see anything, but you, you do see one photon. And the great thing about this is that simply because of the kinematics, the energy of this photon you do see is in one-to-one -one correspondence to the invariant mass of this uh, uh, invisible system. So if you measure the energy of the photon, you can tell the mass of this invisible system. And because we're talking about this strongly coupled theory that leads to a bunch of resonances, in principle, you can look for these resonances. Unfortunately, for the parameter we took, the uh, be uh, KK, uh, super KKB has energy resolution that actually uh, ends up washing out these uh, resonances. But if you go to a low energy machine, there's one machine in Beijing which is running at 3 GeV and so on, you can pick out these resonances in this uh, dark QCD sector. And in principle, of course, we don't really know how to work out these resonance spectrum in from uh, the, the QCD calculations, but in principle, once the lattice calculation will improve in the future, you can determine the gauge group, number of flavors, and their masses, and so on, from this E plus E minus data, looking at this uh, wiggles uh, of, of the resonances in this dark sector. So that would be very exciting. So we call this dark spectroscopy. And of course, the just like in our QCD, maybe there are also even heavier uh, quarks. In that case, those states can also show up uh, at the, the uh, super KKB as well. So this is just a, the example where we're putting the same mass as the charm quark in a dark sector. Again, you don't see them, but you can still see these bumps uh, with, within the energy resolution of the experiment. So uh, that allows us to get into this range of the parameters. So uh, it's getting actually quite sensitive to uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, experimental signature. Now, only one bit about TV energy scale, because this is a TV particle astrophysics conference. And of course, we are still looking for the signal of any new physics that might solve the hierarchy problem. And, and there's a very tight constraint, as everybody here knows. But most of these tight constraints are on colored particles like gluinos, quarks, and, and KK gluons, and so on. So if there were a solution to the hierarchy problem that doesn't involve extra particles with color, then we could still be in business of actually addressing the hierarchy problem. And the famous example of that type is called twin Higgs theories. So this is actually a slide I borrowed from Ronnie Harnick, who actually uh, was one of the initiators of this uh, twin Higgs theory. The idea is that I have standard model here, and I have a copy of the standard model, and then you uh, require Z2 symmetry to swap them against each other. And, and this is pretty much the only thing you need to do. Then it turns out that the potential in the Higgs sector uh, has, has actually a large, rather large symmetry, like uh, SO8, accidentally. And that large symmetry is broken by the expectation value of the, the, the twin standard model by a large expectation value F then the standard model Higgs boson turns out to be one of the number Goldstone bosons. So they are guaranteed to be light, protected by the symmetry, and that's one way of trying to solve the hierarchy problem without introducing new colored particles. So in this uh, twin standard model, you have twin QCD, twin clock quark, tw twin weak interaction, and so on, but they don't carry our uh, color or our standard model uh, 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 charges. But nonetheless, you can actually go through these loop calculations and show that uh, these bad quadratic divergences actually cancel against each other. So it is a solution to the hierarchy problem. But for the hierarchy problem, the only important couplings are top view color coupling and SU2 gauge coupling. And for the lighter generations, your color couplings are so small, so they are not really required to cancel against each other. They're already small to begin with. So you can fiddle with the mass uh, 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 spectrum of light generations without screwing up this mechanism. So let's say up-down strange quark can be basically arbitrary. So we could actually, in principle, use this twin QCD in this framework as our dark QCD to produce the same dark matter. So uh, it's quite natural to think that this twin Higgs actually doubles up 
for both purposes, namely to address the hierarchy problem and also give you this new kind of uh, dark matter candidate at the same time. So for the simplicity, let's choose, for example, UDSCB uh, to be all degenerate. Let's assume there's no CKM mixing. Then all of the quarks are stable. You have this big flavor symmetry. And also make all the leptons heavier than them, so that like GeV, so that pi ion cannot decay into leptons. So uh, once you turn on the weak interaction, pi plus can decay into mu plus new, uh, new, uh, neutrino. But if they're heavier, then of course that wouldn't happen. And, and I can also choose the hypercharge assignment in such a way that it's eventually anomaly free because it depends on the usual hypercharge in B minus L. So that all quarks and leptons have charge plus minus one half. So the neutral pion, for example, UU bar minus DD bar, doesn't decay into gamma gamma because triangle diagrams are both one half squared, but they come with the opposite sign, they cancel against each other, so the neutral particles are, are stable. So this way, uh, we could, in principle, address the hierarchy problem at the same time. So I declare that, that let's not talk about hierarchy problem at the beginning of my talk, but I came back, and in principle, we can address that as well. So here's the conclusion. So this is a surprisingly an old theory, nothing as big as supersymmetry extra dimensions, but can address the, uh, uh, give you the uh, viable candidate for dark matter. So we're talking about actually a simple miracle cube Mass scale is the same as our strong interaction. Coupling is about the same as our strong interaction. And the theory itself is basically the same copy of the QCD. So this is the miracle cube, which is better than Wimp miracle, which is only two miracles. Here we got three. And it can solve the, the, the issue with the dark matter profile, uh, especially in dwarf galaxies and in this merging galaxy system. Very rich phenomenology. There's an in principle possibility of doing even spectroscopy of this dark sector and may also solve the hierarchy problem as a bonus. So now it's the opposite direction, but we try to solve the dark matter. As a bonus, we may end up solving the hierarchy problem at the same time. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have any questions? There's a few up here and over here. I can't see because of, of the light, so you have to wave. Hi. Oh. Yep. Is it, is it me? I'll come, okay. we'll, we'll come over. Hi, Atoshi. Great hey. talk. So in the, in the normal WIMP model, it's easy to imagine how you could find it. For example, seeing dark matter annihilations, recoils, all of that stuff but it's very hard to falsify the normal WIMP model. Let's flip the script and think about this one you talked about here. Is it easier to falsify this? For example, if you can show that the elastic scattering is, can't be as big as a born. Yeah, the elastic scattering, unfortunately, is rather tiny, at least for this uh, vector pole I talked about. And, and here you see these numbers, 10 to minus 42 square centimeters, 10 to minus 40 square centimeters. So uh, the direct detection, uh, in principle, can get in here. If you can see the electron volt scale, like using a superconductor or uh, 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 the, the band gap in semiconductors, but it doesn't really sort of uh, uh, get uh, into the entire prominent space. Right. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. I meant the elastic self-scattering, like oh. you talked about the core cusp kind of ah, thing. Ah, yeah, yeah. So for example, if we could prove astrophysically that you can't have self-interactions uh -huh. up to a bone, uh -huh. could that falsify the model? Uh, not completely, because uh, as I showed in this plot, um, the, the, the self-interaction is these dashed lines, and within this band where you can have the correct abundance, you still have some range. It, it's in the same order of magnitude, but if it ends up being, let's say, a, a, a half square centimeter per gram, maybe it's not that relevant for the core cusp issue. So uh, uh, it's, you, you can get in there, but probably not completely. So if, if astrophysically we were able to show that self-scattering has to be below, say, a millibar, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. would that falsify the whole class of models? Uh, yeah, for millibar, I would say yes. Okay, so yeah. the, the point is that the importance of astronomical uh, data in testing dark right. matter. Right. So it really has a 
key role in falsifying mm -hmm. this. Absolutely. Right. Okay, thanks. So one thing I'm actually trying to do uh, uh, in, in my, on my team is that we're building a new uh, multi object spectrograph for Subaru. And for that, uh, we can actually map out the uh, velocity profile in a nearby dwarf galaxies uh, in, in a very uh, efficient manner because you can take spectrum uh, 2,400 of them at the same time. So we, we hope to do a much better job in, in really trying to see if there's a, a discrepancy between the mass profile and, and the uh, simulation. And, and as I also understand that uh, uh, the, the hydrodynamic simulations are also getting better. And if there's a baryonic physics that blow out these cups, then that should show some consequence on the chemical uh, abundance of, uh, uh, of these stars, which you can also see. So hopefully we will learn actually a lot more about that on a five to 10 year time scale. Can you get a microphone? Wait for the microphone. So there could be velocity dependence, so you can have strong interaction in the early universe, then it frees out. So it wouldn't affect the late time uh, perturbation. So it's possible to make it work out still. Like, you know, theories are smart, so. <laughs> yes, oh, is this on? Um, so I wanted to ask you about your claim of making pi unstable by just killing off the chiral anomaly. Uh -huh. So if, even if this happened in the standard model, pions would still be unstable because in the, in the chiral limit, right, the decay is governed by the anomaly, but generally you have some spurions that coming from higher dimensional operators that are controlled by the, the quark masses. And so, uh -huh. you know, I think, I think it's important to keep in mind, I don't think this is the case for all the SIMP models, but mm -hmm. for a certain classes of right, them, right. You, you kill off the chiral anomaly, but right. in general, you would still expect these neutral pions to decay. So they could, actually, in this uh, example I mentioned earlier, this is still very much work in progress, but when you use this twin Higgs theory uh, and uh, make uh, uh, UDSCB or degenerate, uh, uh, so the, uh, the, uh, uh, as long as you're looking at the pions among the downtype quarks, um, so uh, they, they are not uh, totally protected by weak interaction, but the bottom quark uh, actually can go through top quark, which is special, violates the flavor symmetry, so it can actually annihilate uh, into the standard model. But it so happens that uh, the decay rate is on the time scale of BBN, so you can still probably accommodate it, but this is something uh, that is still preliminary. So once you actually start breaking these flavor symmetries at some level, you're completely right, you need to really check whether they decay on cosmological time scales, and sometimes they do, but if they are within the certain interval, they could still be okay. So that's what I'm trying to show. Uh, you showed, um Oh, can you go back to the plot where you show the uh, constraints on the vector, where, on the dark where, photon? Where here, oh, up here. Ah, oh, okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> can you go back to the plot where you show the constraints on the vector, boson, or the sure. dark photon? Is it possible to probe this also indirectly through indirect detections? I mean, this, if it couples to electron positrons, you see, you should see it also in indirect detections, right? Yeah, but uh, so, so pi pi going to the dark photon into E plus E minus, because the pion has no uh, uh, angular moment spin, uh, the going through dark photon means they have to be in P wave. So it's actually extremely suppressed uh, 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 in the current universe. Hi, hello, um, great talk. Um, I was interested in the, uh, th this constraints plot and I noticed that the mass of the dark matter, or no, okay, so this is the mass of the vector, right? This is the mass of the vector. Oh, I see, so the mass of the dark matter is still I, in the hundreds I, of MeV? Yeah, I think there's 300 MeV in this plot. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I think that answered my question, okay. thanks. Uh, one down here. Hi, <clears throat> so, um, as I was watching the talk, I'm thinking of this uh, experiment that I'm proposing um, to detect millicharges uh, being produced in at the LHC. Maybe you know of it, maybe not. If not, you can hear a talk later by me this afternoon. Um, but okay, welcome. The name of it is Mil Millikan, and it looks for millicharges being part produced by L LHC. Okay. Um, it's very sensitive to things that are produced to, with a kinetic mixing of, of, of a photon in the massless limit of that uh, ah. dark photon, because then you have uh, dark charges which are milli-charged colloquially, but, you know, re related to the, um, mm -hmm. to the mixing angle, mm -hmm. that your vertical mm -hmm. axis here. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, I, I think that such an experiment would be sensitive to the physics you talked about here in the case where the dark, your new dark photon would be uh, massless, or, uh, but 
you choose to show the, the massive case, and I was wondering why you uh, have done that, and if, if, if it also, if there is some parameter space, including the ma massless. And uh, the, the reason I assume that dark photon is massive is because we wanted to avoid this process of pi pi annihilating into a dark photon, which then further coupled to e plus e minus. So that's why we had to keep this mass of dark photon heavier than the dark wire. So unfortunately, I don't think there is a parameter space where the dark, uh, the dark photon is massless in this context, unless coupling is incredibly tiny. Sorry, Toshi. Sorry, Toshi. Can, can you just elaborate why that process is so bad, pi pi goes to pi v? Oh, it, well, it, it may not be bad. So oh. this, this, if this is actually an important process, then the freeze-out mechanism is not discrete too. So we just oh. focused on the case where 3D2 is a dominant freeze-out okay. mechanism. But you're completely right. Maybe this is the dominant mechanism, and you could still have the correct abundance okay. at the end so, of the day. So in other words, the SIMP mechanism is only realized above that. That's right, line. right. But it doesn't necessarily say that the lighter dark photon is bad. Yeah, thank you. We just didn't look at it. So for the, um, for the coupling, strong coupling, so if you have the 3 to 2, then your m pi over f pi is your expansion, is, is your coupling parameter, right? Right, right. And um, in a large NC, like, uh, can you go to that slide? Sorry. For example, this. Yeah, so in a large NC, like if you make your f pi to be small, uh -huh. then your mass of your row mass will also be small. They might That's break right. the chiral perturbation. So right. I'm just saying, that, yeah, this one, the perturbati perturbativity bound might be actually lower. Uh, Maybe, yeah. yeah. So, so I want to ask you, do you have some idea of having like the, like uh, that uh, theory that don't have to go to like a uh, perturbativity bound? Um, the weekly interaction, weekly, uh, weaker interacting. Yeah, so, so one, like one thing we did look at is, is this, this different idea that uh, the, the SIMP is actually not the pions, but rather a non navier gauge boson uh, became massive by Higgs mechanism. In that case, coupling doesn't have to be at least huge. It's order one is, uh, actually works. So, so that is more control. Right, more sort of perturbative. Okay, okay. Thanks. Good. So my job was to poo-poo a TV scale in TPA. So I did my job, and now John is unhappy, I'm sure. But anyway, I'm done. Okay, thank the speaker again for a great talk.